So in 1 Samuel chapter 20, I think we see here a great example of what it means to have a faithful friend, a faithful friend. And this is, of course, coming on the heels of, you know, David's already, uh, you know, fled from the presence of Saul, having a javelin thrown at him. And you remember last week, Saul's pursuing him. He's sending after him his servants. They're coming to find him, and he's, he's been spending time with uh, the prophet Samuel. And they show up, and they prophesy, and they try to get to David three times. Eventually, even Saul himself shows up. And if you remember how it kind of ended there, Saul, when he showed up, I mean, the Bible says he stripped off all of his clothes, and he fell down on his face all day and all night, and he prophesied. And that was just showing us again that God protects his people all the way through. God will protect his people. And it, you would think that after something like that happened, that maybe Saul you know, would get the message. That he would finally kind of get through to him that, hey, I can't touch David. In fact, when I try to do anything about it, you know, I find myself humiliated. But that's just not the case. You know, uh, of course, Saul is still pursuing here. Is that error up a little bit? Can we turn that down? Did anybody turn that down? I don't know what it's at right now, but if we, yeah, if we get it down to about 70... I'm going to make everybody else mad, but I'm, I'm burning up up here. But it says there in verse 1, And David fled from Naoth and Ramah, so that's where all that had taken place, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done, and what is my iniquity, and what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me, and why should my father hide this thing from me? He's saying, look, nothing's going to happen. If my dad was planning anything against you, I'd know about it. So he's kind of trying to reassure David here, that everything's going to be fine. <coughs> but David kind of argues back a little bit and says in verse 3, And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in the night. He says, He knows that you and I are buddies. He knows that you gave me your, uh, you know, you took off your robe and your mantle and you gave me your shield and your sword. And he knows that you were showing me favor, that we're friends. He says, He knows that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this. He said, The only reason you think everything's okay, Jonathan, it's because your dad's keeping it a secret from you. <clears throat> he said, lest he be grieved, but as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. I mean, at this point, David's really fearing for his life. Then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. He says, you know what? You're right. You just tell me what you want me to do, David, and I'll take care of it. <clears throat> so Jonathan here, he's trying to reassure David and David, he argues back and says, no, your dad, he's on to us. And he goes and he sets about to prove it. You know, jo uh, Jonathan says, hey, whatever you want me to do, you, just, you tell me what to do, David. You know, I, okay, you don't believe that everything's going to be all right. You think your dad, my dad's going to kill you. What do you want me to do about it? Tell me what to do. And he says in verse 5, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I shall not fail to sit with uh, the king at meat, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father had all missed me, then say, and then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. So if you, ca if you catch this, David's asking him to tell a lie. Does David go to Bethlehem to eat, the, eat, eat this meal with his family? Not at all. He goes and he hides in the field. And what that's showing us is that in certain instances, you know, lying is, is <laughs> you know, it's almost, it's almost an okay thing to do. I, would, I mean, I would say if you're trying to preserve life, it reminds me of, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the midwives in Pharaoh's day, you know, where the, the commandment was to throw them all the children in the river, all the males in the river. And what did the midwives, the midwives feared God, the Bible says, and they wouldn't do it. But what did they tell Pharaoh? Oh, we fear God, we won't do that. No, they said, well, you know, these, these Hebrew women, they're lively. You know, by the time we get there, they've already got the kid, they're, you know, the family's there, there's nothing we can do about it. They were lying. You know, that's not at all what was taking place. And why were they lying? to try and preserve life, to try to, to, to keep people from being harmed, you know, to protect the innocent. And that's basically what David's going here. I don't want to go on about that, but it is interesting that that's another example of that in Scripture where we see a man of God saying, hey, go ahead and, you know, tell this lie to your dad in order to, to, to find out what's really going on here and preserve my life. Therefore thou shalt not deal, uh, he says in verse 7, If he say it thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. So this is the plan that David's concocted to figure out and to prove to Jonathan, because David's already convinced of everything. He already knows, <laughs> your dad's going to be mad. I already know what's going to happen. Let me prove it to you. Let's, let's have this, concoct this little scenario, and I'll prove it to you. The way, and it's all based upon the way Saul reacts. 
So David's plan is to gauge Saul's intentions based on the understanding of that whatever, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's how he's gauging Saul here. You know, and that, that, you know, that's a way for us to gauge people too. You know, you can gauge people by the things that they say. You know, if you give people time to just talk and speak, you can get a real understanding of what kind of person they are. You know, whether, you know, the kind of things that are coming out of their mouth. That kind of tells us where, what's important to them, you know, what they value, so on and so forth. But that, you know, that's the principle that David's putting into, prin- into action here. He's saying, hey, go tell him I'm not coming to meet. And if he says it is well, everything's fine. Oh, okay, he's having dinner with his folks. Fine. Then we know everything's okay. Because here's the thing. Why would I be upset if, you know, somebody else decided to go eat at somebody else's house? But he says, but it be, if he be wroth, then, you know, evil is determined by him. Why, why would Saul be so upset that David wasn't there? Because Saul is plotting to kill David. He wants David close so he can slay him, so he can kill him. He wants to throw that javelin again. I mean, if Saul had no ill will, then he wouldn't have been upset at David's absence. And how is he gauging this? By the words that were going to come out of Saul's mouth. It says in verse 9, And Jonathan said, Far be it from me, for I, certainly, uh, for I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon thee. I, then would I not tell it thee? He's saying, look, if this is the case, you know, of course I'm going to tell you. And why is that? Because, again, as we talked about in, in previous chapters, Jonathan is a loyal person. He's a very loyal man. He has integrity. He has character. And more, and even beyond that, he is David's friend. What we see here with Jonathan and David is, is, is a great example of friendship, of, of true friendship, of faithful friends. <clears throat> and he's saying, look, I'm, going to, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to try and deceive you. I'm not going to try and you know, uh, take you out myself. Look, I'm just going to tell you the truth. You know, and that's all we could really ask from people, isn't it? I mean, that's what we would rather have from people than anything else. I mean, it would be even, you know, even, if, even if people hate you, even if people don't like you and despise you, you would rather have them just tell you that than to fake being your friend. Than to say, oh, no, I love you. You're my friend. I'm loyal to you. When inwardly, they're not. They're bitter. They're angry. They're, they're envious. They're, they, they're malicious. And they're just biding their time until they can lash out and take you out or inflict pain upon you or harm you in some way. But we know that's not the case with, with uh, Jonathan. That Jonathan is a very loyal man. He's a loyal, he's a faithful friend. <clears throat> so he says, look, if this is the case, you know, if we go and we do this and I tell my dad that and he gets upset, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to hide that from you, David. I'm going I'm to tell you the truth. And David's saying, well, great. But he says, but, or, 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 he, and then said David to Jonathan, verse 10, who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? So they're just kind of working through the logistics here. You know, the, the practical part of how this is going to play out. Because remember, David's not going to be there to hear this. He's not, you know, Jonathan's not going to go there and secretly live stream this, you know, in his pocket or record it and be like, this is what my dad said. And email it to him later, text it to him. You know, these are the, these are the practical things that you had to think about before smartphones, right? You had to get that message to David. David's busy hiding out in a field, you know, sleeping with the, the critters. So he's got to find out, well, how am I going to find out, you know, what's going to take place? So you can see how they're kind of working together in this whole thing. You know, David's trying to convince Jonathan. Jonathan's trying to reassure him. He says, okay, well, let me prove it to you. I'll stay back. But hey, how are you going to tell me? So you can just see how this is just playing out very practically. Verse 11, it says, And Jonathan said to David, Come and let us go into the field. And they went both of them into the field. And Jonathan said to David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any, or, uh, tomorrow any time or the third day and behold if there be good toward David and I, then I send it not unto thee and show it thee the Lord do so much more to Jonathan. <clears throat> so we see here that the purpose behind what's taking place with you know, telling Saul one thing seeing how he reacts and getting the news to David or getting the news uh, or, or seeing how he reacts that the purpose behind it was David's right? David's the one that has the, the you know the the, the desire to know. The purpose is his. I mean, does it really matter to Jonathan at this point? Like, if, David, if David's, if Saul's mad at David? I mean, it bothers him. He's grieved by it. He'd rather it wasn't that case. But it's really, it's really no skin off his teeth. I mean, it's, it's, 
You know, he's not the one that's having his life threatened. He's not the one that's, uh, you know, being eyed, you know, e evilly by the king. He's not, it's not really going to bother him. So the purpose is David, but notice how also there's an element of trust here between David and Jonathan, where Jonathan is actually the one working out the specifics. He's the one that are kind of, is figuring out, okay, well, let's, let's go through this and let me tell you how we're going to work this out. So there's an element of trust there. David had to trust in Jonathan. One, that he was going to come and tell him the truth. You know, two, that he was going to tell him it all and that they were going to, uh, you know, ex um, basically it comes down to this is that, you know, David had to trust Jonathan. And you know what? David did trust Jonathan. And why did he trust him? Because he knew how loyal he was, because he was his friend, because he was faithful. He was a faithful friend. And go over it. Keep something there. Go to Proverbs chapter 27. I'm kind of, that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. You know, when you go through these chapters, you got to kind of think about well, what's the one thing you want to kind of want to get across here. And if I could get one thing across tonight is, you know, don't undervalue friendships in your life. You shouldn't undervalue friendship in your life. You know, we say it, we would probably say of a lot of people, this person's my friend. You know, and I, I you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm in the fifth grade or something, but you know, you have your friends and then you have your best friends, right? Does anybody still have best friends even as an adult? Of course. And who is your best friends? It's the people that you're closer to. The people that you would probably tell things you might not tell some of your other friends or acquaintances, right? People you would confide in, really let them know what's going on, talk to them about, you know, private things. You don't let everybody in on that. You know, well, some people do. <laughs> some people go on Facebook and just, you know, barf all over the place. <laughs> let everybody just smell it. It's like, what in the world are you doing? Don't you have a friend? <laughs> you should get one. But I'm, what I'm get set, getting at here is that you see that David and Jonathan, they are very close friends. And we should not undervalue friendships in our life. Friendships are very important things. You know, and I, and I pay attention, maybe I just pick up on this a little bit more than others might because of the fact that, you know, when I was growing up, you know, when I was about seven or eight years old, I, well, I don't know how old I was, probably nine or ten, whatever, however old you are when you're in the fifth grade. How old are you in the fifth grade? Does anyone know? I'm not the only one. Wow. <laughs> Isn't there somebody in here in the fifth grade? Nine. It depends on what country. Oh, what country and everything? Okay. Well, let's not break it down by country. What about in the United States, where I'm from, where we live? Because <laughs> that's where I went to school. Nine, ten years old, right? So by that time, you know, I had developed some friends. There were some guys in my neighborhood. You know, I mean, we were riding bikes together. We were lighting fields on fire. That's another story. <laughs> you know, we were, we were hanging out, you know, staying over at each other's house, so on and so forth. We had, I had a couple of really good friends. But, you know, in the fifth grade, we moved, you know, from South Dakota to Michigan. You know, and I, and I had to start all over again with friends. You know, I made a few friends, but, you know, I, I feel like maybe from that time forward, I never really knew what it's like to have a really close friend again. And what I've learned, you know, is that you, c you don't want to undervalue friendships in your life. And you can even get kind of jaded. You can kind of say, ah, friends aren't that important. But actually, they are. I mean, wouldn't you say that Jonathan's a pretty important friend to David at this point in his life? I mean, he's got nobody. I mean, he's got Samuel. I mean, he, he's got the Lord. But I mean, just in a more practical way to kind of hash things out and, and, and to have somebody to lean on and to go to and say, hey, what's wrong with your dad? What can we do about this? You know, is, isn't it a good thing that he has a guy, a faithful friend that he can go to who he knows that he can rely on that's going to help him with this problem? Don't we want that for ourselves? Don't we need that? I think everyone needs that. I think we should want to have friends in our life. You know, and I, of course we should have friends, you know, in, in a broader sense that, you know, we're, we're we friends in church, you know, and, and, and other places, friends we make at work, and, and people that we talk to, acquaintances that we see. But, you know, we should probably, hopefully, we all come to a place in life where we have at least one or two good, close friends. People that we can really lean on and trust and know that they're going to do what? Be loyal, be faithful, that they're not going to stab us in the back, that they're going to help us. And they're not just out for themselves. I mean, Jonathan, <laughs> again, remind us of, of Jonathan. You know, consider Jonathan's position in all of this. The king's son, the next in line to the throne. He's the heir to the throne. And here you got this guy coming to him, David, saying, hey, what's wrong with your dad? Don't you? And, 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 you know, I'm supposed to be king, basically. And everyone knows it. Jonathan knows it. David knows it. Saul knows it. 
I mean, if Jonathan had been the type of guy that was just out for himself, what could David have done about it? Hey, go hide by that rock, and I'll come tell you what my dad says. And just gone right to dad and said, he's over by that rock. Go get him. And we know, again, that God would have protected him no matter what. But that could have been what Jonathan did. But that's not the type of person Jonathan was. Jonathan was a, a loyal person. He was a man of integrity, and he was a faithful friend to David. And we should never undervalue friendships like that in our life. You know, don't ever take a friend for granted and, 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 and turn on them. You know, and don't be the friend that turns on somebody. You know, maybe one day we all might need that friend to help us out. You're in Proverbs 27. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, a friend loveth at all times. A friend loveth at all times. You know, and some of my closest friends, the people that I would consider, you know, my best friends, are the people that have always treated me the same. You know, when I did something stupid or I messed up or I said something wrong, they didn't just like, forget that guy. I don't want to be friends with him anymore. You know what? No, they loved me at all times. You know, and they treated me exactly the same. They might have even said, well, yeah, that was stupid. But, you know, I forgive you. I love you. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. Hey, I'm sorry to hear that. But they didn't change the way that they treated me. It didn't change the way that they, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the love that they had for me as a friend. They loved me at all times. And that's what a real friend does, by the way. They love at all times. You know, David didn't come to Jonathan with this problem, and, and then Jonathan's just like, oh, man, you're such a drag. See, I got other things I could be doing right now, man. I, you know, I, I won't thank you for the water. I could, you know, I got, I'm the king's son. I, I, I got more important things to deal with than you. You know, sometimes being a friend is inconvenient. Sometimes it's not always easy. <clears throat> it says, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You know, that's how you find out who your real friends are, is when times get tough, when there's adversity. You know, when a line gets drawn in the sand and people have to start deciding where they stand. You know, that's kind of where you find out who's, who's, side, who, who's with you, you know, and who's not, and who your faithful friends are. Are you in Proverbs 27? Look at verse 10. He says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. You know, don't forsake a friend, because that's not what friends do. They don't forsake each other. A friend loveth at all times. A brother is born for adversity. They're not fair weather friends. Where they, we think, oh, this person's my friend. We get along. We spend time together. And then as soon as something gets, you know, there's, there's a conflict or there's, there's trouble, there's adversity. It's like, where are they? They're not, picking, they're not returning the call. They don't want anything to do with you. They turn on you. Well, you know what? That person was never really a friend then. Because a real friend is faithful. A real friend does not forsake you when you need them. He said, Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother afar off. You know, it's a lot better to have a friend nearby than some distant relative to help you out. You know, it's better to have a friend, you know, and, 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 and you know, it could be just real simple, practical things. You know, sometimes people get in a pinch financially. People get in a bind where, you know, they're behind. I know I've had to do this in the past, you know, and it, there's no shame in it. And people, this happens to people. You, you know, that they're working hard. They're trying to make ends meet. They're in a situation in life where some unexpected expense comes up or whatever. And, they, you know, <laughs> they're coming up short. You know, it would be better to have a friend you could go to and say, hey, can you help me out in this? You know, and this is just a practical example. You could think of other ways. You know, when it comes to, like, having to borrow, maybe borrow a little money to pay rent or something like that. It would be better to have a person like that nearby who could help you than have to bother some relative who's afar off, who might not have seen you, maybe doesn't care as much, isn't as, you know, involved in your life. You know, we should, we should never take our friends for granted. You know, I, I, I think about all the times I've had to call a friend up when I had this a car that wasn't running very well, and I was kind of tight, and was couldn't really afford the new battery or whatever, and I was constantly having to jump this car. And uh, it was just, it was falling apart. And I remember for like three or four months, probably about every other week, I'm calling the same guy. Hey, can you come give me a jump? Hey, can you come and give me a jump? I'm stuck here. And it was like winter. He's like, yep, every time. I think about the people that have driven, you know, I, I, I'm, boy, I'm really, it's all coming back to me. 
I've, I've gotten a lot of people to come jump my car. <laughs> Finally, I bought one of those die-hard battery packs that you just keep in the trunk. You can just jump at any time. You don't even need a, another person's car. That was the final solution. But I remember there's one guy, he, he came out several times. And then one day, you know what? He called me and said, hey, can you come give me a jump? <sighs> oh, man. Really? I'm busy. I'm working. <coughs> Look, it's better to have somebody nearby that can come help you than, you know, just some some blood relative that, you know, is, is far off. A friend love with at all times. Don't undervalue your friendships. You know, y- you might find yourself in a position where you really need a friend someday. Hopefully you've taken the time to make some friends. You know, it's, import- it's an important relationship. And we're living in a world today where people are becoming more and more isolated. People are just doing everything online. They're, you know, you could, I mean, you r- at this point, you could practically just probably live in your house Work from home, shop from home, do everything from home and probably never have to go out except for maybe like, you know, certain things. You, you know, you maybe got to go to the DMV every two years. You got to go, you know, whatever. Some just, you know, out of the ordinary thing. But there's people that could just, you could just live your whole life in isolation today. Don't, and do you think there's people out there doing that? Sure there is. I know for a fact there's people that are living their whole life completely cut off from the outside world. I remember, you know, I hope you don't mind me telling a story, but I remember I got sent when I was a locksmith to go rekey this lady's house for this guy. And my boss said, look, the guy, you know, he, he, he's, the, he's the landlord. I, he owns several properties. I've done a lot of work for him. And he said, look, this lady died. She's not there. We need to rekey her house. And he said he, she had a bunch of cats. And nobody even knew she died. This lady went into the hospital and died. And Nobody, nobody knew for weeks. I mean, I went there, and there's just like all these notices from the city. Hey, you got to cut your grass. You got to do this. And all these bills are piling up. No friends. The neighbors didn't know. I mean, and she's in a neighborhood, residential neighborhood. No family to tell anybody. Just a cat lady, literally. You know, and I got out of the van, and the, the, st- the smell was so bad I could smell it from the curb. It was, and I, I went to the first door. And the door was just a, it was just a blue tarp. And I had to walk through this path. The whole driveway was filled with like, she was a hoarder. I mean, it was just a, a path narrow enough for you to walk to the door. Just piles of old cat food everywhere and cat bins and cat litter and cats running around. And I said, I'm not, I called my boss and said, I'm not going in there. <laughs> he said, all right. I said, you know, I'd go in about anywhere and I've done it. I've been in some nasty places, but I'm not going near that house. Why do I tell that story? Because there's people today that, that they do undervalue friendships. They burn everybody. They're not interested. They just want to isolate themselves. They just want to draw in, in, you know, draw back. They just want to, you know, turn inward, become an island unto themselves, and they, they don't value friendships. You know what? Friendships would probably help you live a little bit longer. You know, friendships are important. That's what we need to learn tonight. I mean, it was sure important for David to have a friend like Jonathan in his time of need. Look at verse 13 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel ch- uh, chapter 20, verse 13. The Lord do so much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do the evil, then I will show it and send thee away that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee. And catch this phrase right here. As he hath been with my father. That's a very interesting statement that Jonathan, or Jonathan makes there. He says, the Lord be with thee as he be with, been with my father. And so Jonathan here, he's acknowledging the fact that, jo- that the Lord had once been, not notice he said, as he hath been with my father. He didn't say, as he is with my father. He's talking in past tense, as he hath been with my father. So Jonathan's acknowledging the fact that the Lord had once been with Saul. And what this shows us is just how far Saul has fallen. He, you, you wouldn't say that about Saul now. In fact, from what we've read, the Lord is sending an evil spirit upon Saul and vexing him. So this is, you know, again, we don't want to lose sight of the fact because, you know, Saul gets pretty nasty from here on out. I mean, he's already been pretty nasty. But don't lose sight of the fact that Saul at one time had, you know, been blessed of God, that he, God chose him to be the first king of Israel. God anointed him. And, and, and it's a very sad story about Saul. And it's a very, you know, grave warning to the rest of us. 
But this statement also shows us that Jonathan's loyalty is with the Lord before anyone else. You say, what made Jonathan such a loyal friend to David? The fact that he was loyal to God. That's what made him such a loyal friend. That's what made him such a good friend to David, who was, you know, who was the newly anointed of the Lord, who was the next king of Israel. You know, that's why it made Jonathan so loyal. Even to the point where he's willing to, you know, con- he's basically conspiring against his own father, right? Not to do his dad harm, not to do evil to him, but to just to find out the truth about the situation. Jonathan's loyalty is with David because Jonathan's loyalty is with the Lord above everybody else. If you would, go over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. You know, and Jonathan would have known the law. In all likelihood, he would have heard it. And he probably would have heard Leviticus 19, which says this, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, but thou shalt, and thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So, Jonathan here, he's not a respecter of persons. He's not respecting the person of the mighty, is he? Well, I can't do that, David, because my dad's the king. He's mighty. He's got a lot of power. No, he's in judgment. He's going to get to the bottom of this. He's going to find out the truth. And he, don't care. he doesn't care who comes out on top. Because he's, he, all he cares about is judging in righteousness. That the truth be found out. That the Lord be magnified. You know what? And we should, have, we should seek to have the same integrity as Jonathan in this area. You know, we should be loyal people. We should be faithful people to the Lord, obviously. You know, and if we would do that, there, obviously there's going to be certain people that we're going to remain loyal to because we are loyal to the Lord. We're going to be faithful to them because we're faithful to the Lord. You know, we're going to be faithful to our church if we're faithful to the Lord. We're going to be faithful to our spouse if we're faithful to the Lord. We're going to be faithful to our parents if we're faithful to the Lord. We're going to be faithful to whoever we're supposed to be faithful to in life if we're faithful to the Lord. We put Him first, and everybody else, just the, the, the pecking order just works out right after that. It works itself out. And if we would just determine that above all things we're going to be faithful to God, you know, then all our other relationships would be right. At least from our end, at least from our side, we would be right. We should have the same integrity as Jonathan. You know, we, we should seek to have that in our life. Look at James chapter 2. It says in verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves? Are you become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Saying, look, we shouldn't have respect of persons, and, and James is getting real specific here, especially in church. Especially in church. You know, and this type of thing takes place a lot. I mean, a lot of church, people will go into a church, they, they don't go to church because they love God. They don't go to churches because, you know, they love the word, they're there for the preaching, they want to serve God. They go to church because to, it's kind of like a show. It's a social club. They want to show up and see what kind of people they have there. What kind of connections can they make? You know, who can they rub elbows with? You know, who's sitting up front? You know, what, kind of, what hat is she wearing this Sunday? You know, those big, those big church hats they wear. It's a fashion show. They're there to impress people, to earn the respect of persons. You know, and, and even in a church like this, this kind of attitude can creep in. Well, we might see somebody come in, a visitor show up, and maybe they don't, they're not all put together. They don't have it, you know, they're not sharp looking and, you know, saying all the right things. Maybe they're a little rough around the edges, or maybe they're really rough around the edges. You know, in our own mind, we can start to think, well, this isn't the kind of person I want in church. What are they doing here? Why don't we get, you know, the, the, why don't we get the high rollers in here? Why isn't high society coming in here? Because they wouldn't want the preaching, first of all. They don't, they're not there to hear the truth. They, they, they probably wouldn't make it very long if they did come. They'd come in here and look around and go, Pff, look at this little church. In an office complex, where's your steeple? How many acres you got? How big's your parking lot? You know, Who's on the treasury board? Well, how, you know, c- could I be a deacon? Yeah. I tithe a lot. 
I make a lot of money, I should be the deacon. That's their qualification. You know, they're standing in the community. But that's not how we ought to be. We shouldn't have respect of persons. We shouldn't judge people based on their appearance, you know, their, their financial standing. You know, we, should, we should love people for who they are. Let them, you know, come in and, and treat everybody the same. You know, it's all level ground at the cross. He says in verse 6, But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So I'm just kind of making application here specifically to the church. You say, well, you know, I want to be, I want to be a faithful person. I want to be a loyal person. Like Jonathan. Okay, great. Be faithful to the Lord then. Be loyal to God. Because that's who Jonathan was loyal to above everybody else. The reason why he's such a faithful friend to, jo to, John, or to David is because his loyalty is with the Lord above everybody else. And, you know, and if, you, if that's the type of person you want to be today, then you know what? You're not going to have respect of persons just like Jonathan didn't have respect of persons. You know, and we can kind of Get a, we can kind of get a feel for that, you know, where we're at in our hearts about this, on our attitude about church. And that's kind of what James is saying here. It's what he's showing us. You know, sometimes people will walk in, and, you know, and I don't think it's a problem here. I think our church is great about this, about greeting visitors. You know, if anything, we bulldoze them. You know, if anything, we're, we can probably draw back. I'm just kidding. You know, but we don't just go, oh, you know, I'll talk to them after they come six more times or... You know, whatever. And this kind of attitude can creep in, you know. And people can say, oh, they're never going to make it. I'm not going to waste my time talking to these people. Or some new face shows up. Well, they haven't been here as long as I have. They don't know what they're in for. You know, whatever. They get, people can get this, you know, haughty attitude about other people that come to church. Oh, man, they, didn't even, they couldn't even put on a pair of khakis. So, maybe they just came from work. You know, not everybody has to show up, you know, in a three-piece suit and, and all dudded up to come to church. You know, that's, it's not what it's about. You shouldn't sit here and judge people over carnal things like that. And that's exactly what people do, isn't it? Is that not what, what he's saying? Like, look, one comes in a, a poor man in vile raiment. Now, there's no one here in vile raiment. I mean, he's talking about, you know, ever been around a guy that's in, it's just, you think about vile raiment, it's like, you need to go home and wash that. That should, that should be in the dirty hamper, not on your back. You, know, you should be washing that, those clothes. Those type of people that would walk in. And you know what? This, is, this really does happen. I mean, we'll have people come by, and they're, they'll stop in, and they don't, they're not looking too good. They're not smelling too good. They're rough. What's our, what's our first reaction? I can't wait for this person to leave. What do we got to do to get this person out of here? Is that the attitude we should have? Not at all. We should not have respect of persons. And you know what? If we're faithful to the Lord, like David, and like Jonathan, more like as our example tonight, we won't have that. We'll say, well, maybe this person, you know, just needs to get in church for a while, understand some things, grow, learn, and the Holy Spirit will work, we'll support them, we'll love them, and give it time, and let God work on their hearts. You know, one, of the, one thing I always remind myself of, or have been reminded of, I think about it is, and no offense to anyone in the room tonight. <laughs> but you know, sometimes people, they come to church, and it's, it, it's, they don't have everything put together. In fact, sometimes, we, and I know I didn't, and I'm not claiming I have it all put together. I've got my own issues and things I'm working on. So we should never have this attitude of people need to walk in and have just their, all their ducks in a row, spiritually or whatever. But sometimes people, more, some people come to church with more problems than others. I mean, some people come to church and you think, they're weird, okay? I'm not thinking of anyone in particular tonight. <laughs> you know, be careful here, right? But I've had that thought, and you think, man, these, this, this person, is, this individual is a, is a weird person. You know what? Our job is to, to make them normal. That's our job. If all we want is people to show up who just fit the perfect mold, be prepared to be a church that doesn't grow. You know how the Lord's going to the Lord's going to add to the church and he might add some people that you might just find a little odd. 
who maybe just don't fit your ideal for a church member. You know, we got this like, well, we're gonna, we're, our church is going to grow, and everybody that walks through that door and becomes a part of this church, they're just, they're, we have some kind of, you know, just preconceived notion of what they're going to be like. And then, those, then the people that God's actually going to build a church with show up, and we go, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would have done that. Well, they have this problem, or they have that problem. So what? You know, we should all be able to just look back to when we got started with the Lord. I remember where we were when we first walked through a door of a, of a Baptist church. I mean, I think back to all the thing, all the dumb things I said and did early on in my Christian life, and just now I can remember that. Why my pastor gave me that look? Why sometimes he would just kind of smile and go, <laughs> not say anything? I'm like, oh, now I get it. Because I was being an idiot. You know? But you know what he was? Kind, patient, gentle, meek. And he gave it time. And <laughs> look at me today. <laughs> still got problems. Still not perfect. And some of you are probably thinking, you're a little weird. I saw you eating that chicken soup before service. Like some kind of animal. <laughs> right? You know, I'm just trying to make application tonight out of the story. That, you know, Jonathan is a faithful man. You know, he's faithful to his friends. And why? Because he's a loyal to the Lord. He's not a respecter of persons. And so we can apply that in our own lives, you know, by being faithful to the Lord and, and, and being faithful to the people that we ought to be faithful to. And, you know, having the right attitude about people in church. And having a realistic idea about what church is going to be like. Who's going to come to church? How the church is going to go. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll move off from this point, but I want to point this out again. Look at verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. <laughs> Paul here, I mean, I love how he gets real. And he's not, he's not bashful at all with the Corinthians. He's basically telling them, you're weird. Right? <laughs> he's saying, you want to know who, you wonder what I'm talking about being the weird one? It's you. Right? That's basically what Paul's doing with 1 Corinthians. He's saying, for you see, your calling, brethren. He's saying, you, he's saying, this is what you're like. You see how you are, right? He's, he's basically, I mean, you want to talk about bringing it home. He's parking it and it's falling. He's throwing it right in their lap. You see, your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Well, wait a minute, called you? Did you just say I wasn't a wise man? Did you just call me a fool? Yeah. Of course, after the flesh. He's saying not many noble. He's like, none of you are big shots. Nobody in that church is some somebody. A bunch of nobodies in that church. That's what Paul's saying here. I mean, that's what it says. You see, you're calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty are called, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Well, thanks, Paul. What a nice letter. Hey, did you, hey, did you read that letter from Paul? What did it say? He called us a fool. He said, we're all a bunch of fools in here. And of course, again, it's after the flesh. You know, the world would look at this and say, what are those people doing? Going to church again. The neighbors would look out the window and see you backing out, you know, packing up the family. Going, they were just there this morning. Why are they going back? Fools. It's, it's, it's Thursday at 6.30. Why are they going back again? They all went out. They all had their Bibles in their hand. I mean, once is enough. Good night. Don't they know you've got to go on Easter and Christmas? What do they think they're doing over there? Who do they think they are? They're a bunch of fools. They're just wasting their time. Not many. God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things. I mean, he's really kind of just taking them down a notch, right? And he's saying, look, he, everyone in church is a fool. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're weak. And they're base. They're despised. Things they are, and the things which are not to bring it not things that are. So don't be surprised if somebody walks into church, you know, if, we get, if, if people start coming to church, then maybe they're a little weak. Maybe they're a little base. Maybe they're in vile raiment even. Maybe they're just not everything we hoped our new church members would be. Because that's who God chooses to confound the wise of this world. 
you know, we see somebody who, you see somebody come to church, you know, they're new to church, and that's pretty much everybody in the room, by the way. Right. <laughs> that's a new church, okay? I mean, I know there's people that have been going to church for a long time, but look, when somebody comes to church, when, when there's a, when is new to church, and they've got a lot of room to grow, that's exciting. That's exciting. Amen. That's not like, oh, God, I got it. All right, let's start all over again. Right, I'm going to hash this over again. You know, where were you last year? I, ta- I already, already taught this. Is that the attitude we should have? Not at all. Because you know what? There's a lot of churches out there. There's never new faces. The only thing that changes about the faces is they just get older and wrinklier. <laughs> teeth start falling out. Hair is turning gray. It's not a new face. It's the same old tired face. <laughs> And you know what? You want those too. Right. Everyone's wondering why I shaved my head because it's getting too gray. <laughs> Every time I look at it, gray, gray, gray. Right? It's all right. You know, we want the, we want that too. I'm not saying we just only want new people all the time. We want seasoned Christians. We should never have this attitude of just, well, we only want new people if they just got it all put together. That's that's the wrong attitude. Because, you know, God's going to choose the weak. God's going to choose the foolish things in the world. God's going to choose the base things. To do what? To confound the things that are. To bring to naught the things that are. Look at verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, God uses weak people. God uses plain, ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill people. Because they have something that a lot of the the mighty of the, the world don't have. It's called humility. And everyone, you know, any one of us that accomplishes anything for life in the, excuse me, accomplishes anything for Lord in this life, you know, likely is it going to go, well, look what everything that I did for God. They're going to say to God be the glory. Amen. And then we all, you know, anyone who's, who fits this description, weak, base, foolish, all, you know, the, the type of person Paul's describing here, that type of person, the person that's going to give all the glory to God. Who, by the way, deserves all the glory for everything that's done for him. It only makes sense that those are the type of people that God's going to use so that he could get the glory, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I mean, some big shot, you know, some some big shot in the world gets in the local church and, you know, starts serving God or something, you know. I mean, imagine the foolishness of getting to God and saying, it's a good thing you had me in that church, Lord. <laughs> Boy, Lord, it's a good thing you had me preaching down there in Tucson. I don't know if that place would have made it without me. Good thing you picked out me. So I don't, I don't know that you could have done it without me. That's a bad attitude. Right. And you know what? We should we should be on guard for that type of thing. Amen. And that's why God uses the the, the weaker, the hum, the basically humble people, because they they know like, well, God didn't have to use me. God doesn't need to use me. God could use any one of us. Could use anybody. Who are we? That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Not glory. Well, you know, my, my financial standing, my position in the community, my, the influence I have here in Tucson, you know, I've really been able to accomplish a lot for Christ just given, you know, my position, the people I know, the way I network. No, anything we accomplish for God, the work that we're going to do in this church, in this town, through this church, is going to be accomplished through the grace and mercy of God. Amen. And he's the one that's going to get the glory for it. Amen. I mean, yeah, of course we want to we want to take, and I use this term loosely, pride in a job well done. We want to we want you know we want to have a heart that we're ambassadors for Christ. We understand that, but we're ambassadors for Christ at the end of the day. But uh, I need to move on from this point. <clears throat> Going back to First Samuel, chapter twenty. Versus, you know, so so where are we at in the story? You know, Jonathan and David they come up with the plan. Jonathan kind of lays down how, it's, how he's going to get the message to him. Hey, go hide by the rock. I'll shoot the arrows. The lad will come get them. If I say, you know, they're beyond me, you know, evil's determined, get the hints. <clears throat> we'll pick it up in verse 24. It says, So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to meet. And the king sat upon a seat as other times, even a seat upon, by the, a seat upon, excuse me, even upon a seat by the wall, and Jonathan arose and had her sat at, by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean, sure he is not clean. 
So Saul, it's telling us the kind of inner monologue of Saul. Saul's like, well, David's not here. Why isn't David here? And he says, well, he didn't say anything that day because he just thought, well, he's not here because it would be it wouldn't be right for him to be here. He's not clean. Okay. <laughs> and then it says in verse 27, and it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, you know, he's like, okay, now there's no excuse for him not to be here, that David's place is empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked, leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away. I pray thee, and send me, uh, and, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not at the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse and rebellious woman. Now, this is a very interesting insult. <laughs> because you're, you're his dad, all right? He's basically, you're talking about his mother, who happens to be your wife. Okay. It just goes to show you like where Saul's at. I mean he's he's not a he's he's lowered himself. He'll insult anybody and everybody. He's he's that full of wrath. And he's ang his anger's kindled against Jonathan. Okay. He said, Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to, to thy own confusion and under the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? He's basically saying, you know, your mother's naked sound about it's it's like a shame that you were even born. Is kind of what he's saying here. The way you're acting, it's a, it's it's almost shameful that you exist. The shame of your mother's nakedness. Okay, that's how I that's how I read that. That's what I get out of it. Other people might take that a different way. Some of these euphemisms of old, you know, who knows what he meant exactly by it. But I believe that's what he's talking about there. He's basically saying like, look, it's a shame that you, it's like the way you're behaving. It's almost it's embarrassing to even the fact that you were even born, that your mother even gave birth to you. But notice there, he's saying, he, you know, David was dead on. He's like, look, your dad is is determined to to, to kill me, and he knows that you and I are, are best friends. He knows that you and I have a pact, that we have a covenant, that we're 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 friends here, and that's exactly what you know David called it. He said. Do I not? I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion. Look, you chose him. You prefer him over me, your own father. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now, send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So David's suspicion is proven true by, by Saul's own testimony. The plan works, right? Because a good man out of the tr good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So David knew this and he puts this, you know, applies this principle, puts it into action, and basically lets Saul hang himself. You know, he, he lets him do all the talking. You know, when I was reading it, I just thought about, because I like to watch like, um, you know, like true crime interrogations and stuff like that. You ever see where they, these police interrogators sit down and they'll interview these people who are accused of things? And one of the strategies that they use is just try to get them talking. Yeah. You know, to use different strategies just to do what? Just to get the person to open up and just start to let things go. Just so they, they can figure out, you know, you know they're basically for people to condemn themselves with their own words. Which is why they try not to, you know, even bring up lawyers. You know, they want them to just spill the beans before the lawyer shows up. So, you know, it's kind of like that. That's kind of what, what David is doing here. He's saying, look, just let your dad do the talking. You know, go, go tell him this and watch the way he reacts. Listen to the words that comes out of mouth. He'll tell you everything that's in his heart. You know, that's so true today. If we just let people start to do, people will tell you. If we really listen, people will just tell us what they really think and feel. <clears throat> but, uh, so David's here, you know, his suspicion is proven true by Saul's own testimony. You know, and uh, and this truth here, what comes out, you know, it shows the contrasting characters of Saul and Jonathan. What's Saul's motive? Is it to, 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 to kill an evil man, somebody who's worthy of death? No, it's to preserve his own bloodline on the throne. And he's more concerned about his own legacy, his own, you know, his, 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 uh, his, his, um, you know, those that are going to come after him. He's more worried about that than he is about David's own life. He's willing to kill just to keep his own name on the throne. And Jonathan answered, look at verse 32. Now what's Jonathan like? 
oh, then you're like, oh, yeah, what was I thinking? Oh, Dad snapped me out of it. You're right, I'm, I'm supposed to be king. What? <laughs> this whole time. Thanks, Dad. I'll go get him. Let's kill him. It's two different natures. You know, Jonathan is not following in the footsteps of Saul. You know, and this is important to remember because, you know, we'll get to it, you know, spoiler alert, you've probably already read it or heard it, is that, you know, we know Jonathan ends up dying with his dad. And it's very tragic. You know, we could, when we read about that story later, you read about how Saul or, uh, or Jonathan dies with Saul and David laments them both and David laments over Jonathan. And because Jonathan's death truly was tragic. He was a good man. And his dad kind of took him down with him, didn't he? And, you know, this is just a great example of why David lamented so much, because Jonathan was a man of such great character, integrity. He was not like his dad. He couldn't just be tempted with carnal things like the throne. He was more faithful to God than to just some position. And Jonathan answered Saul and said, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? Very direct questions. And really, these questions, you know, when you really think about what's taking place here, this is Jonathan calling out his dad's sin. This is Jonathan calling Saul out. Wherefore shall he be slain? What, shall, what hath he done? What is he saying? He's saying, you're trying to murder him. This isn't justice. What's he done? Nothing. He has done nothing worthy of death. If anything, he's proven himself faithful and loyal to Saul. He's fought his battles. I mean, he's his son-in-law. He's, he's, he's fought for Israel. He's done everything that Saul's asked him. He's never lifted up his hand against him. I mean, he's, he's playing music to soothe him. He's been, you know, he's, he's cared for Saul. He loves Saul. He wants to help Saul. He feels bad for Saul. I believe that. And Jonathan here just calls Saul right out. Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? He's basically calling out a sin. Because, I mean, do you think Jonathan was expecting an answer? Like, well, he did this, this, and this. I mean, Saul's already told us why he wants him dead. Because he's going to be heir to the throne, and you're not. And he's saying, well, you have no right to kill him. He's done nothing wrong. Jonathan calls out a sin. And Saul has no answer but to react violently. It says in verse 33, And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. Well, wait a minute, Saul. I thought you were so concerned about 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 Jonathan taking the, the throne, and now you're you're throwing javelins at him. I thought it was real important that he gets on the throne, but now you're you're throwing a javelin at your own son, the guy who just a breath earlier you were saying, well, you're supposed to be the next king. No, well, let me kill you. Why? What happened between those two things? Where Saul's like, oh, you're supposed to be king, so now he's throwing a javelin. He got called out for his sin. That's what happened. And in, in between those two instances, you know, John says, what's he done? Wherefore he's saying, what evil hath he done? You know, and, and, and there's that saying that, you know, a personal attack is the last defense of a guilty person or something like that, I'm paraphrasing. You know when you're in an argument with somebody and you're right and you've got them cornered and you pin them down and the only thing that's left for them to do is just admit they're wrong? You know what a lot of times people resort to? Just personal attack. They'll just say some nasty thing. They'll just they'll just insult you, or they'll just discredit you by saying, "Well, you're stupid." You know. You know. I, when I was thinking about this. I was like thinking about how many times you know I got in an argument with my my sister. You know, and and she was right, and she's calling me out for being the jerk that I was. You know, and rather than just then I was being a jerk and saying I'm sorry, it was like, all right, well, now it's time to have a, a good old-fashioned pillow fight. You know, and take the pillows, start going at each other. Or, wrestle the other one to the ground just react violently just react physically try to overpower somebody why because they just you know when someone really gets you and you're just like oh the right that's what's going on here you know saul he just got called out and his head is like he's right i've got no reason to kill david and he's calling him out in front of abner and anybody else who happens and happens to be there just being publicly called out. You're a sinner. What you're doing is wicked. He's done nothing wrong. You're wrong. Instead of just admitting he was wrong, he just reacts violently. You know, and, and often that's what that's the only defense that guilty people have. When you whittle them down, when you, when you corner them, 
and you pin them down, a lot of times that's the only reaction that they have is just to lash out. You know, and we see that, you see that, I've seen it in churches where people, you know, they, they're, 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 do, they're behaving poorly, they're, you know, they're being wicked, they're going behind the pastor's back, they're talking smack, they're doing this, they get called out, and a lot of times you know what they do, they just, they, they get kicked out of church, they leave the church, whatever, and they go out and they just go on a smear campaign, they just go out and they try to just, just make everybody look as bad as possible. And they're the ones that are guilty. They're the ones with the problem. And because they don't want to deal with it because they get pinned down, rather than just admit they're wrong, now it's just like, well, let's just lash out. Let's just see, let's just see how much damage we can cause along the way. That's kind of what Saul's doing here. He gets pinned down. That's what guilty people have. That's their last offense. They get pinned down. The only thing you can do is just lash out at everybody else. Look at verse 34. So Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger. Now, you know, just a bit of humor. It's like, maybe maybe Saul should work on this javelin throwing business a little bit. You know what I mean? Because this is like, what, the third one he's thrown and missed? It makes you wonder if he's missing intentionally. Like, he's just all for show. You know, just trying to scare him. You know? Or maybe maybe Jonathan and David are just the younger guys. They're a little quicker on their feet, you know, and, you know, anyway, it's the thought I had. And he'd eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David. So again, he's more worried about David than himself. He's like, oh, my dad threw a javelin at me. I'm so mad. He's grieved for the fact that it's true that Saul wants to kill David. Now he knows it for a fact. And he's sad. He's grieved for David because he knows, you know, this isn't just anybody that's mad at David. This is the king. And people are going to follow him, as we'll see. And people are going to pursue David. And Jonathan knows this, that it's on, that there's going to be a fight. And it bothers him. He feels bad for Jonathan, or for David's sake. It says in verse 25, And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out of the field at the time appointed with David and the little lad with him. And he said unto the lad, Run, find out the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. Which is really what he's saying to David. That's the message to him. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. Now at this point in the story, the message has been delivered. Okay, think about this. The message has been delivered. Right? He shot the arrow. He said, The arrow's beyond thee. That was the code word for my dad wants to kill you. Then he adds the emphasis of make haste, speed, you know, flee, go away. The message has been delivered. Jonathan's fulfilled his duty, right? But notice what he does. He says, but the, the lad knew not anything, and only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his artillery unto the lad, he was bow and arrow, and said to him, go and carry them to the city. He sticks around. Because now he's going to say goodbye, you know. And this, again, is why? Because he's a friend. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a bond here. There's, a, there's emotion, you know, and that's okay, <laughs> you know, and these are two tough guys. I mean, these are, these are men of war, right. you know, and sometimes we get this idea, you know, that if, if you, know, you know, big guys can't cry or something, I don't know, <laughs> it's, un, it's unmanly to have emotion. Now, I will say that, you know, you can go too far with it. Some guys are all emotion, right? There's a time and a place, people, <laughs> okay? You know, this wasn't, you know, every day. This was a very obviously a significant moment in both of their lives. And Jonathan, you know, isn't just going to be so callous as just deliver the message and not say goodbye to David. Because they love each other. They're friends. They're loyal to one another. And as soon as he, the lad was gone, verse 20, David arose out of the place that south, of the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times and they kissed one another. Now obviously only a perverted mind would go to the place to think that that kiss was anything sensual. Even today, in some parts of the world, men, that's a common greeting. You know, the ma ma. you know. We don't do that here, all right? Don't try that. Okay, handshakes, fist bumps, we're good. We're just a, what's up, you know? <laughs> the nod. But that was, you know, this is something that they're, he's, you know, they're expressing their, the grief that they're feeling. And wept one with another until David exceeded. And a very emotional moment between you know, these, these, these grown men, you know, showing us that this is, 
This is a, this is a part of the human experience. You know, it's they weren't just going to bottle that up. You know, and they're just they're afraid to to show any emotion. Okay, <laughs> it's okay to show emotion, guys. <laughs> These two great examples of two godly men who were very manly that were able to do that. And they're expressing it one to another over the fact that what? That everything that they suspected, or that David suspected, was true. That Saul wants to kill him, and that they have to part company. Because that's really what is grieving them. The fact that now they both understand and know David's got to go on the run. He's got to go flee for his life. And it grieves Jonathan because of the fact that he knows that David is in the right. That his dad is wrong. That, that Saul is, is wicked for wanting to do this. That you know, David should, should dwell at peace. He should be the next king. But now he has to flee for his own life. And here, here's the lesson. It kind of goes back to, to, to friendship. Is that true friends are hard to part with. True friends are hard to part with. You know, when you really have a close personal friend, it's hard to say goodbye to that person. Uh, if you would, well, I'll just read to you. I just have a few passages for sake of time. But it says... A, tr- a man that hath friends, this is Proverbs 18, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know, there's some friends that are just even closer to you than your own flesh and blood. Maybe we don't all have that. You know, not every probably not everybody's gonna have that in life, but that's definitely the case here with with uh, Jonathan and David. Their their souls were knit one unto another. And why why was that? Why were they so close together? Why were they so had such a close bond with one another? It was because of their love for the Lord. That's what brought them so close. It's because they both had such a deep love for God and that they saw that in one another, and that's what made them very close friends. And that's what made you know this parting so difficult is is, is the fact that they were so close. You know, and, and I want to just kind of close in this thought about friendship is that you know friendship is a two way street, okay? It says a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. You know, and and you'll you'll hear people every so often say, well, I just don't have any friends. And I think to myself, I'm not surprised. (laughs) And I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, it's, it's, it's because I think to myself, well, you're not a very friendly person. You know, if we think, I don't have any friends, you go, why is that? Maybe, maybe everybody else isn't the problem. (laughs) Maybe just like, I can never make a friend, I can never make a friend, I can never make a friend. Well, maybe they're not the problem. Maybe you are. Maybe you need to work on being friendlier. You know, I, I know that this is something I had to work on at one point in my life. You know, I, I got it to a point where it was just like, I don't care if I have a friend or not, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? And I didn't have any friends. And then when I got around to wanting to make friends, I realized I was kind of a jerk. You know, and, and some of you are like, yeah. I know. When you're telling me, you're like, why am I not surprised? <laughs> and you have to kind of work on, you know, smiling, saying hello, being nice, asking them about them, you know, actually endeavoring. It's a two-way street. You can't just sit around and be like, all right, I'm ready to make friends. Who wants to be my friend? The line starts right here. Line up. We'll see if it works. No, it's you have to go to them. You have to, you have to put yourself out there. And, and, and go to where people are and try to show yourself a friendly person. Because nobody likes being friends with a jerk. No one likes to be friends with a guy that treats everybody poorly or takes people for granted. You know, people want to be friends with people who are friendly people who know what it means to be a friend. It's a two-way street, and not only that, it's only proven when tested. You know, you really only know who your friends are when it's tested. Kind of like with Jonathan and David. That friendship was put to the test, wasn't it? And you know what? The, and you know what David found out? He had a real friend in Jonathan. He had a very close friend in Jonathan, and that's why you find David on his face when it's time to say goodbye. That's why you see David falling to the ground three times and weeping upon his neck, you know, until he exceeded more so than he did. Because at that point, I'm sure David knew Jonathan is my real friend. He probably felt that way, and you know that was what he would have considered going into this whole situation, but now he knows it beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man is my friend, that he's loyal to me, that he's faithful. And why is it? Because it was tested. It was tested. At any point in the story, 
Jonathan could have just turned on David. And he said, he's hiding right now. We got him right where we want him, Dad. And taking the throne. Now, again, I keep putting in that you know, caveat that the Lord would protect him. But, you know, it shows you, you know, Jonathan could have come up short. Jonathan could have turned out to be a real not-so-good guy. But now David knows he's got a real friend because it's been tested. And, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of close by saying this, is that, you know, true friends are, are few and far between. I mean, we're going to have friendships, we're going to have acquaintances, we're going to have people that we're close with that we spend time with. But true friends in our life, they're few and far between. And I've heard it said that if you could end your life and be able to count how many friends you have on one hand, you've, you've lived a good life. And, and, you know, it's not always because people turn out to be bad. Sometimes people just, life takes people in different directions. You know, those friends I had back in South Dakota when I was a kid, I would have thought, oh, I'm going to be friends for my whole life. You know, but life took us in different directions. You know, we all ended up in different parts of the country. You know, sometimes that's the case. You know, and probably more often than not, that's the case. You know, but sometimes, you know, maybe it's something else that, that causes friendships to cease. You know, maybe people change. You know, here's a good example. People get saved. I mean, I think about all the friends I had before I got saved. And then when I got saved, how I got rid of all those friends. And it wasn't like I got rid of them like, like I had to beat them off with a bat or something. It was, we were both kind of glad to see each other go. In fact, it was a friend who said, hey, man, you can't, you can't sit here and talk about Jesus and then do what you're doing at the same time. You gotta, he told me, my friend, you have to choose one or the other. And I said, okay. They just didn't expect me to choose Jesus. <laughs> which is what I did. I said, well, if, it, if that's the case, then I choose the Lord. Amen. And you know, and I went a little while without any friends, you know, but I've since made friends. You know, and, and it's hard, you know, to, to go through things like that when friendships are broken up, you know, friendships end. But you know what? That's why you shouldn't take them for granted. It's all the more reason to cherish the friendships that you have. They're invaluable because they're, they're rare. A real friend is rare. And, uh, you know, true friends ultimately should be in Christ. You know, I'm not saying we should never talk to anybody that isn't saved or have a conversation or, you know, share a laugh or an experience or do something with somebody who isn't a Christian. But, you know, your closest friends in life should be friends in Christ. You know, and here's the thing about that friendship is that that is a friendship that will last forever. You know, I mean, we could probably mess it up here on earth, but... You know, we'll, we'll, it'll all be water in the bridge in heaven. <laughs> Hopefully, right? Yes. Hey, we were friends on earth. Remember that time you did me dirty? <laughs> I don't think that conversation is going to take place. You know, maybe I'll just be like, Lord, put me on the other side of the New Jerusalem tonight. <laughs> I, had, I had enough of him on earth. <laughs> but it will, it's a relationship really that can last forever. You know, one great area that you can apply this to is marriage. You know, your, your, your friend, you know, what did, what did Solomon say to his wife? He called her his, 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 his uh, well, he called her his friend. I can't remember what, you know, you know, very endearing terms, but one of those terms that he called his own wife was his friend. And that's an important relationship, you know, friendship, because it involves loyalty, right? Its relationship will last forever. It says in verse 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went to the city. Now this wasn't the last time that Jonathan and David met, right. or got to see each other. But they didn't know that at the time. They didn't know that at the time. We look back, we know the whole story. We say, oh, what's the big deal, guys? Why do you get so emotional? What's with all the tears and the sobbing and everything? So it's not like you're never going to see each other again. They didn't know that. As far as they're concerned, this is the, this is it. They're never going to see each other again. Two people who, you know, have a, a, a deep love and respect for one another in the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> you know, and the Bible says in John in John 15, "This is my commandment that you love one another, as I have loved you." Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now that, that, that's, you know, that's the example that Christ gave us. You know, Jesus didn't lay down his life for his own child. I mean, that, you, you would, if, if a parent would be unwilling to do that, that would be unnatural. And I'm not undervaluing that. I'm not downplaying that. You know, of course, any, any, any uh, you know, 
decent parent is going to want any evil to befall them rather than their own children. But would you say that about a friend? <laughs> would you say, I would rather I get cancer. I would rather I go through that trial. I would rather I go through some hardship than this person who's not related to me. He's just my friend. But that is the, you know, that's, that's, that's a hard question. You know, I remember po- people were posed that to me once about saying, well, I don't know that I'd take a bullet for anybody other than my wife. Well, what's the example of Christ? He laid down his life for his friends. And greater love hath no man than this. And, you know, I don't think that that's... We could say that we would be willing to do that, but we would never really know until that were tested. Where, and, and we pray God it never is. <clears throat> but the Bible does say in 1 John 3, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, if it came down to it, we should be willing to do that. Now I'll say this, if, if, if it's just you being stupid that gets you into hot water, <laughs> I might just go ahead and let you suffer the consequences. <laughs> you know, but if it comes down to, hey, you know, suffering for righteousness sake, you know, allow, allow it to happen to me. You know, I would, I would gladly, we should be able to say we would gladly bear that rather than put it on a brother. <clears throat> but whoso see this world's good and see if his brother hath need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth in the love of God? How dwelleth the love of God in him? You know, it's easy to say, oh, I would lay out my life for the brethren. I would do all these great things for God. Okay, but what if your brother just has need? You know, the chances are no one's going to ever, we're never, I'm never going to have to lay down my life for any of you. And none of you, for anyone, anybody else in this room. Chances are. I mean, we're living in a, in a very safe place, part of the world. We're probably never going to have to be called upon to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, literally speaking. But what about, you think that just maybe at some point in your Christian life you might come across a brother who has a need? Like you can't sit there and tell me you're going to lay down your life for the brethren if you can't even meet a brother's need. You know, who so see the half this world's good? And I just, who so go to Juanitos and sees, you know, the casino and the, <laughs> the chicken soup there? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Say, so Brother Corbin's got a need. Right? <laughs> That's what happened today. Somebody saw that and said, Brother Corbin's got a need. They did not shut up their compassion from me. <laughs> they had compassion. And of course, I'm joking. But, you know, think about all the needs that we have in life. All the just, you know, everyone has times where, and I'm just talking about simple things, like little things. You know, I got, you know, I got to move. You know, someone's got to move. Hey, can you help me move? Oh, sorry, I was doing something like that. You're not doing anything. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know. We can't say that we, we, you know, we're, we're going to go so far as lay down our own life for the brethren if we're not even willing to help them in a time of need. And we should be willing to help brethren in need. So let me just conclude by this. I'm just kind of rattling here. But it says, you know, our true friends, you know, they're going to be revealed not just by their words, but by their actions. I mean, Jonathan was probably saying all the right things. He was probably saying, you know, we've made a covenant. You know, I'm not going to do your seed any harm. You don't do my seed any harm. He even made a show of it, you know, gave him his buckler and his shield and, you know, all of his, his, the, the garments that he had to, to show that, hey, he's going to be the next king, not me. A lot of words, right? But then there came a point in the relationship where now it was beyond words. Now it had to be action. And that's how David found out, I've got a true friend in Jonathan. Not because of the things he said, but because of what he was willing to do. Because when it came, to, when it came down to it, he proved himself to be loyal and faithful to me. <clears throat> and if you have a friend like that, if you, if you find a friend like that, you should value them and be loyal to them, even to your own detriment. Even to your own detriment. That's what true friendship would do. Say, I'm going to be loyal and faithful to this person, even if it brings evil upon me. I'm not just going to, you know, turn my... That's what loyalty is, by the way. It's not, it's not just doing, you know, doing right by somebody when it's easy. It's, it's when, hey, if I say this, if I call you out for what this person's doing, when somebody's, you know, uh, attacking my, the person I call my friend, when this person's attacking somebody that's called, I'm saying, is my friend, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back out on that just because they get mad and pick up a spear. True friendship is going to stay loyal to that friend even if it brings them harm. 
even when it's going to cost them something. In fact, I would even submit to you that's the only way you'll ever know who a true friend is. Is that when that loyalty is actually tested. That's who you find when you find out who really is your faithful friend. Let's go ahead and pray.